optimistic and confident do you feel about being able to grapple the transition uh, that we are in the midst of today, and especially from a financing point of view? Put it down for numbers. Well, put it, uh, putting it into numbers, it's um, as high as $7 trillion of additional investment every year for the next 25 years. That's a global number. So these are enormous amounts. But if I can put it into another number, it's roughly an extra two percentage points of GDP globally. And that would just bring the level of investment in the global economy back to where it was at the turn of the millennium. So it's something we have collectively done in the past. We can do it again. Obviously, we have to not just go to where the emissions are, but actually do something about it, get them down, have the right investment. And look, India is going to be absolutely central to this, not just within what will be very shortly the third largest economy in the world, but in terms of its impact globally. I'll talk about India in just a second, but you know, about getting things done, and you just yeah. gave us a whole bunch of numbers there. Uh, you also believe that this is a big commercial opportunity. Yeah. So within that, what is the role that the government can play uh, outside yeah. of subsidizing some of these aspects? And what's the role that the private sector, you believe, can play in this? And how do we ensure that some of this is viable? Because that's perhaps where the public-private partnership is going to have to come in. That's exactly right. And, uh, Sri, if I can go back to start with where the governments are, the most important thing for governments is to be absolutely clear about where they're going, to build credibility with consistent policy, to have clear objectives for sectors. So if, if you're in the UK, you're in the European Union, you're in Canada, you know that you cannot buy a new internal combustion vehicle after 2035. The consequence of that, and by the way, that doesn't cost the government any money. What it says to the private sector, the whole auto industry and all of the value chain for that is we have to ramp up very quickly for EVs only. Um, and it's the credibility of that commitment which drives what is enormous investment from the private sector. What does the private sector need to do? Uh, it needs to recognize a couple of things. One is just the absolute scale of the opportunity. I quoted the seven trillion number. That is a big number even for the private sector, even for Brookfield. Uh, secondly, to recognize that being low, lower carbon or having the prospect of reducing your carbon is what's going to drive your valuation. Look, we're already seeing it in the major markets that you get a much higher valuation premium if you're lowering uh, your carbon footprint. We see that that's where opportunity is. If we can find those situations, we can come in, get those emissions down. So those are two of the things the private sector needs to do. And of course, it needs to do the thing it does every day, which is get up and figure out how to do things better. It needs to continue to innovate, it needs to help uh, its suppliers, to help its customers move forward, and all of that is really beginning to happen at scale in climate. We talked about the government, we talked about what the private sector needs to do. Let me ask you if you have a view on what central banks can do to address this challenge <laughs> as well, because yeah. you know, we heard from the Fed chief and he said, look, it's not our mandate to be climate uh, policy makers. Do you believe that okay. central bankers have a role? Okay, now let's take what uh, Chair Powell, a good friend of mine, said exactly. He said, we're not making climate policy. policy. That's exactly right, because climate policy is the responsibility of governments. But if I'm in the financial sector or I oversee the financial sector, as I used to as the uh, governor of the Bank of England, I want to know that that insurance company, that pension fund, that bank is taking into account not just where climate policy is today, but where it's going tomorrow. And if I'm lending on the anticipation that the economy is going to be the way it was 10 years ago, I'm going to get hung out to dry. If I'm investing in the past, not investing in the future, I'm going to lose money. And so as a central bank, and different central banks have different ranges of responsibility, the RBI, the Bank of England, um, have about as broad a range of responsibility. That's absolutely what we have to worry about, is that the financial system's ready for the changes in climate policy that's going to come. And that's why you do stress testing, that's why you oversee, and that's why you, last point, at a minimum, you have the climate disclosure so that you have the information to make those judgments. So do you believe that we've made significant progress on this front, on the financial sector yeah. adapting to this new reality? Uh, we've, yes, we have. Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, we have because we're going to get that disclosure. There's. I'm on CNBC, so I can say the <laughs> ISSB, which is the new yes. disclosure standard, and people will know what it is, and that's going to come into force. Sec secondly, uh, it's regular practice to look at what the impact of climate policy will be and physical events will be on 
uh, the borrowers and, uh, and, and my investments. Tell you, at Brookfield, uh, we might be you know, pretty close to the cutting edge. We have $850 billion of assets, and we are methodically going through all those companies because we control those companies mm -hmm. and seeing what their plans are to get emissions down, where they're exposed to changes in climate, changes in policy, making the investments, improving those companies, and we're going to make more money for our investors as a consequence. I'll talk to you about your investment strategy in just a second, but I I'm just want to get to I want to get it. another question <laughs> in on the on the dilemma that central bankers are facing today. And we just got yeah. over with the with the conference in Jackson Hole. Yeah. What's your take on where interest rates are headed? What central banks are going to have to weigh in terms of the balance between rates and inflation? Well, let me say the first thing is I went to that conference for 15 years. I'm very happy to be in Delhi today, and not, not in Jackson not Hole, Jackson and Hall. eating another one of those. <laughs> you know, Mexican meals that they used to give us there. Look, uh, the dilemma, and I think we'll go back to Chair Powell, what he said in his keynote uh, yesterday. Um, his message was monetary policy needs to con continue to be restrictive for a period of time. We're going to keep at it until we get it done. In other words, bring inflation all the way back to target while supporting uh, unemployment. You know, that is, uh, I think, a core message about how long policy is going to be tight not necessarily where interest rates are exactly going to go. And I think that's exactly the right approach to balance uncertainties. You have an uncertainty about, look, we've had all these supply shocks from COVID, uh, 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 the energy shock, other fact. Okay, how long does it take for them to fully end? That's the first question. Other question is, look, uh, businesses and households haven't seen these interest rates for a long time. Mm -hmm. How are they fully gonna react as it flows through? And so by sending the message that we keep policy restrictive, it is already restrictive in the United States, and using time as opposed to level uh, as the way to do so, that's the right way to admit it, you know, balance what is admittedly uh, a difficult uh, set of choices. But, you know, in the long, medium to long term, yeah. what's the impact of a longer for higher environment uh, on the startup ecosystem, for instance, on uh, VCs, for instance, fantastic. on businesses? It's global. absolutely fantastic. One of the things about it is, I think it's, I think it is positive for the startup ecosystem, for the business ecosystem, because look, we actually have positive real interest rates. Uh, you want to have positive real interest rates because it disciplines the allocation of capital. It's not free money that goes is sprayed everywhere uh, without uh, without consideration of underlying business models. People who have access to capital have competitive advantage if they have good ideas. But investors, whether it's Brookfield or others, they're not going to give money to uh, people unless they have good ideas in this environment, and that's and that's the right way. Well, good ideas as well as viable businesses and, and companies that actually return profit. Well, that's what I mean. It's, it's, I, you're right. Uh, ideas, plans, ex execution capability, uh, and on. And it means that a lot of businesses won't get funded, but those businesses shouldn't get funded. And you know with, uh, look, we're not exposed to them, but we're seeing a lot of the, uh, the poor decisions coming home to roost now. Let's talk about India and your thoughts on the Indian economy, the strength of the Indian economy, as well as what that means and will translate into future investments here. Uh, across the board, Brookfield, yes. we've seen, what, about $24 billion being invested yeah. over the last few years across a whole bunch of sectors, not just clean energy. Yeah. Uh, What's your take on the strength and the resilience of the Indian economy? Well, I mean, we, we have been involved for a number of years, and as usual, your numbers are right. Uh, you know, it's about $25 billion of investment. Uh, look, $10 billion of that. Let me, let me give an example, because it's an example of the strength of this economy, uh, which is uh, data, uh, all aspects of data. Uh, but, you know, our, where we're most uh, interested and exposed and where we have expertise is data centers, building data centers, providing clean power for data centers, helping with compute, and the explosive growth, not just because of the growth in the middle class in India, uh, the, uh, you know, the well-remarked well uh, innovation with UPI and, and Advar and others, uh, but also because the export engines and the comparative advantage that India has in data, data processing, data management, um, and, and software. So that's a fundamental uh, growth that's attractive. Secondly, um, what we're seeing in the global economy is two rewirings, one in the energy sector, yeah. what we're talking about transition, and the other is the rewiring of trade routes, the rewiring of value chains. Uh, and this is an economy that has lots of labor, it has, uh, uh, it has um, 
real manufacturing expertise. It's very good at improving manufacturing processes, modular manufacturing, um, and it has the prospect of this big increase in renewable energy. And if I'm looking where to site a value chain, um, this is an incredibly attractive market. And I just listed a bunch of things that play into the types of areas that Brookfield uh, likes to invest. And of course, adjacent to that, we have a real estate sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and adjacent to that, we have uh, a middle class that is emerging in huge scale. Um, and I would add that has a prospect because of the expertise um, in, um, because of the way the financial services sector is being set up, because of the uh, UPI uh, mm -hmm. and the, and the uh, IDs and, and, and the financial services models that can be built across that, that could have a more sustainable consumer finance model than, let's be frank, than we've historically seen as emerging economies go through this part of uh, development, this explosive part of development. So, so there is a lot. Uh, a, a lot that's happening. Yeah. If I could distill that down into three broad themes that you spoke of, which is yeah. digitization and the opportunities yeah. therein, decarbonization and what that potentially means, as well as demographics and yeah. the advantage that yeah. India enjoys there. What could 25 billion be over the next few years? That's a great question. It's going to be bigger. I can assure you <laughs> that. That, that, that I would imagine. I How you. much bigger? Well, I, look, I, I wouldn't want to limit it. Uh, candidly by putting a number on it. Let's put it in big picture terms, uh, $850 billion under management at uh, Brookfield, including 120 of our own capital. We expect those numbers to continue to grow uh, as the world moves to our strengths of digitization, decarbonization, demographics, and let's be candid, deglobalization, that rewiring of the economy that's there as well. So all of that plays in. We see across all our businesses an opportunity to grow. I didn't have a chance to measure it, so I will. Private credit and private equity, where we've been very active, including financial services here. So, look, it's going to get bigger. Uh, I, we, we only run global, we effectively run global funds, and we have priority markets for these global funds, and India is absolutely a priority market for us for mm -hmm. all our businesses. While it is a priority market, even, even as far as your transition fund is concerned, what, $15 billion at yeah. this point in time? What's the expectation there, given the opportunity yeah. that you foresee? So let me say a couple of things about that. One, uh, about 10% of that $15 billion, and let's be clear how fast things are moving. We raised that money. We closed that fund about 14 months ago. We have committed all of that money. 10% of that money, those investments, are in India. And then above that, we've identified some follow-on opportunities, including uh, with Indian partners for manufacturing of clean energy components for a massive investment in Australia, uh, which is going to take out single, you know, uh, material five percent percentage points of Australia's emissions there. So there's an Indian component to that as well. So we'll see a large amount of that. Look, we we spent a year more or less investing. We're going to take out the emissions of New York City, Toronto, and London combined with that one investment. And I can assure you our ambitions for the next fund, which we've just started uh, uh, to look for, are uh, at least as great. Well, uh, big ambitions that you've laid out for us. But if I could get you back to, to tell me what you think about where global growth is today, as well as what yeah. the big risks are to growth. I mean, the U.S. is still fairly resilient. It hasn't yeah. played out on the downside as was expected. Uh, what, what are you most concerned about? What will be the top risks? And what gives you hope and confidence today? Well, look, uh, we have two of our engines in the global economy. I mean, the good news is we have multiple engines, very much India uh, being one of them. And so I can be uh, you know, uh, constructive, optimistic, positive about India, about the U.S., about Canada. Uh, but I've got to acknowledge what's going on in China and uh, the slowdown there, which is not a cyclical slowdown. They're dealing with real structural issues uh, in the property sector, for example. And they'll work their way through, but we're going to see probably slower growth for a period of time, certainly than we're used to out of China uh, for a period of time as they work through. So that's one of the headwinds for the global economy. Uh, and then Europe, uh, you know, the slowdown there, at least in short term, is a little more marked. So we have some of those headwinds. Punchline, though, is to go back to our four Ds uh, that you were talking about, uh, because what's going to drive things is an investment boom. Uh, we're at the start of an investment boom. It's the flip side of us collectively underinvesting over time uh, in 
under investing in uh, resilience of our economies, under investing obviously in the net zero transition, uh, and it's also the consequence of a very positive uh, transformation on the, uh, on the information side, on the AI side. That is what's going to pull the global economy uh, forward over the medium term. You know, you talked about the investment cycle. Uh, given where we see global growth today, but also the fact that people are sitting on amounts of money. I mean, the dry powder is significant at this point in time. Do you see uh, this being used over the next 12 to 18 months? Do you believe it's going to be much more of a wait and watch approach? Uh, what's the take at this point? Well, I would say, uh you know, I, I, I'm not sure that we're in a position where there is significant dry powder. There is uh, capital available to be invested, uh, but uh, there, there is um, what we're seeing uh, in uh, that we have an advantage given the scale of capital that we have, quite frankly, uh, in larger transactions, in bigger ticket investment, um, and ability. There's dry powder in the corporate sector more than there's dry powder in the uh, in the financial sector. It's much more uneven, I would say, in the financial sector. I would say one thing that's pretty crucial, though, is that, in my view, uh, the core of the banking system globally is in very strong shape. Uh, there'll always be some exceptions, but the core is strong. And so the corporate sector is going to lead. The financial sector can reinforce it, and the banking sector uh, should be there. You know, on the banking sector, because we've uh, uh, seen banks in India deliver their best numbers yeah. in a long time, balance sheets are very strong at this point in time. We did have a little bit of a, a concern being raised on account of the Fitch report uh, that came out for the U.S. and then subsequently the view there on banks as well. But do you are you worried about any potential accidents at this point in time? Look, or? I mean, um, one of the things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we try to instill uh, when I was governor of the Bank of England and with the regulators is we want um, banks, the shareholders of banks uh, and the you know the preferred holders and others, we want them to bear the consequences of mistakes that banks make. And there are tens of thousands of banks around the world. Some of them are going to make mistakes. Um, and so we will see, we can call it accidents. Uh, they tend to be accidents of commission as opposed to just things that happen sure. uh, and, and for them to face consequences. And that provides discipline to the system. What you have to worry about if you're the RBI, the Bank of England, the broader system, if you're an investor, uh, the people watching CNBC, uh, you have to worry about if, they're systemic, if there are systemic problems. And I think we're getting ahead of those systemic problems, or at least uh, the regulators have been doing that in the past. And that means that the system, it may pull back on lending, uh, but it's uh, but it's it's not having uh, core systemic challenges, and that is one of the reasons why there has been a bit more resilience in the global economy. Let me end by asking you: the central bank or the private sector, which is better? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Delhi, not in Jackson Hole. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much, uh, and we look forward to seeing you back here in India. Appreciate your time I here on CNBC. It. Thanks very much. We will take a break here on CNBC TV 18, but the conversations continue from the B20 India Summit. We're back in a moment with more.